you know, after that really great breakfast, and I hope we can all stay awake. And uh, it was suggested to me by one of you, I won't say who, that maybe we have 15 minutes of silent meditation. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> I knew we can relax. <laughs> All right, our New Testament reading today, it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And this is just a little story about love. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let us pray. Loving God, Open our hearts and our minds to hear and to understand your holy word and to feel the blessings that you have placed in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, worship is a group effort. Everybody plays a part, whether you are part of the music and the singing or the reading of the scriptures or speaking, whether you're the children or part of the congregation, everybody has a role to play. And it really adds to the service to hear the different voices and see the different faces and everybody playing that part. But there was a small church in the sack, and they had a new pastor, and so he liked the idea of many voices in worship, and so he asked one of his older deacons to lead in the opening prayer. So the deacon stood up and he bowed his head and he said, Lord, I hate buttermilk. <laughs> the pastor opened one eye and wondered where this was going and the deacon continued, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was really perplexed and the deacon continued on with his prayer and this is how it went. Lord, I ain't too crazy about plain flour, but after you mix them all together and bake them in a hot oven, I just love biscuits. Lord, help us to realize when life gets hard, when things come up that we don't like, whenever we don't understand what you are doing, that we need to wait and see what you are making. And after we get through mixing and baking, it'll probably be something even better than biscuits. Amen. Now, I'm not sure that this wasn't an instance where the, deep, the pastor might have been thinking, oh, did I get the right or the wrong person to do the prayer? But ideally, that prayer speaks such truth. You know, we don't always know what God's up to. We don't always know God's plan. And God's plan has so many parts to it. And every one of those parts is an important step. But one thing is for sure, each one of us plays a part in that plan. And our part comes together for us in the role of being a disciple. 
God's plan has to have disciples to carry it out. And so in the last four weeks, we've been through a sermon series where we've looked at what being a disciple is all about. And this was set forth for us by the Christian church based on what Jesus required of his disciples in his day when he walked the earth. So there were four steps. Let's take a quick minute and look back at those steps to refresh our memory. We're told as disciples that we are to follow Christ, to follow with a minimum of self-concern. Now Psalm 119 verse 14 says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Our following of Christ is not just about our own testimony. It's not about our own walk with Jesus. It's about also leading others on the Jesus journey. To be a follower of Christ, we have to look inside of ourselves and see that image of God within us. But as we spoke about before, there's more to that challenge because we have to look inside of one another and see God's image. That's what Jesus would do, and we're to follow Jesus, to follow his actions, and to not neglect God's word. The second thing we are to do as disciples, we're told we are to sacrifice, to sacrifice on behalf of others. So Psalm 119, verse 36 tells us, Turn my heart toward your statues and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. And we know that Jesus teaches us that whoever wants to be his disciple has to deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow him. Instructions from Jesus' disciples to us. The first sacrifice that we have to make is to Jesus. We take up our cross and our sacrifices get out of the way so we can make way for God's way. There's only one cross that we are looking to. Just one. The cross and held the man that gave you life. God sacrificed for you. He gave you his son. Jesus sacrificed for you. He gave you his life so that you could have eternal life. And as disciples, we are called to make sacrifices for one another. The third thing that we are told as disciples, we're told that we are to love. To love with a depth that knows no end. And in Psalm 119, verse 41, we hear, May your unfailing love come to me. O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. For I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands which I love. We are to love and we are to give love. And we learned on that week of love that if we looked at the Beatitudes, if we study them and we understand them, that those are our instructions for receiving and being prepared to give love. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we studied that, we looked at the poor in spirit as Jesus' way of saying, those who recognize that they need God. That they go to God and they recognize it and they tell God. And the kingdom of heaven is then within them. And Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they will have comfort. And that isn't just for the grieving as we know it, but for those who mourn over their sins. For those who go to God and repent their sins, God will show them comfort. When you ask for forgiveness, 
God will give you that peace and that comfort that you need from your sin. And each beatitude was an instruction on how to receive God's love. When you receive that, you are then equipped to share that love with others. And the fourth thing that we are told, as disciples, we're told that we are to seek. To seek to learn more of Christ and to win others to him. Psalm 119, 57 says, You are my portion, O Lord. I have promised to obey your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and have turned my steps to your statutes. Jesus tells us that the one who sent him is also with him. He never left him alone. And Jesus always does what pleases God. If you remember when we spoke of the Pharisees and the Jewish people who were seekers, even when they doubted him, when they didn't believe in him, Jesus never wavered in his faith. He never changed from what he knew God wanted him to do. He seeks and we seek. He brought others to Christ through his testimony. We bring others to Christ through our testimony of seeking. And our greatest testimony is our example of daily living. Now through this series, we have discussed what we need to be a disciple individually, what we're to do, we're, how are we to go about that. But what about when we come together as a church? Because if we look at each one of these instructions to follow, to sacrifice, to love, to seek, you can see that they all go together. You can't genuinely have one without the other. And we can't be disciples without each other. I want to read another passage to you. This is also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Perhaps also another familiar passage to you. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honors to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So what is the church? What is this church? You know, if we take away the pews, if we take away the carpet, if we turn off the lights, if we get rid of the hymnals, and we say, now on, we're going to worship in the field down the street. We all show up there on Sunday mornings and we worship together. We're still Waysville Christian Church. Because what we need to be Waysville Christian Church is each other. 
This church is the heart and the soul of each one of you together. I was talking the other day about how when new people come or we lose people in the church for various reasons, the whole dynamic of the church can change. We have to embrace change, of course, but we also have to handle that very carefully. Just like any individual part of our own body. Because the scripture says, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And all of that together is what we must have to be true disciples. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, children of God, one family together. Whether you have been a member of this church for many, many years, whether you're a new member, or whether you're a friend of this church, you're part of the heart and soul of this church. And all together, when we follow and we sacrifice and we love and we seek, we become the body of Christ. Now, this part of the message becomes a little interactive. So if you're sleeping, wake up. <laughs> if those eggs and pancakes and biscuits are sinking in, wake up. In 1 Corinthians 13, from verses 4 to 6, that well-known passage about love. Let me repeat it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Here's your part. I want you to try some. When I read this passage again, wherever the word love is, or wherever it is assumed, I want you to replace it with your name. I'm going to read it again and I want you to actually, I'm going to do this and you're going to say your name out loud. It's okay. It's okay to talk out in church. I want you to say it out loud. But I want you, and then I'll finish the, the rest of it, but I want you to think of as you do this, as yourself, but what it takes of you to be a disciple. Okay? Here we go. Here's the first one. You're going to say your name. Ready? Betsy is patient. Betsy is kind. Betsy is not envious. Betsy does not boast. Betsy is not proud. Betsy does not dishonor. Betsy is not self seeking. Betsy is not easily angered does not keep a record of wrongs, does not delight in evil. Hmm, how did we do? <laughs> you don't have to answer that part. I'm sure that we all have days when we would do pretty good, and other days where we might just flunk that test. And you know, when I first did this, it was my natural personality, as it may be with yours, to focus on what I really needed to improve. But that isn't what I only want you to focus on. I want you to think also about those things that you are really good at all the time or most of the time. Your strong points of being a disciple. Because as Christians, we're often really quick to point out that we're not perfect and we sin. And, and that's true, but God made you. You have a lot of really great, amazing traits. And so give God a compliment and thank him for those good qualities. And then as disciples, you can build on that strength and use it. And use that love that you see through God and work on the messy stuff. You know, if we look a little further into 1 Corinthians, we learn a little more about what love is and what love does. It tells us that love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, and 
love always perseveres. And then the most beautiful part of that passage in verse 8 that says, love never fails. It seems that with all of the instructions of being a disciple, either individually or together as a church, it comes down to one thing, and that is love. Jesus is love. God is love. Each one of you is created with that same love. I was reading in one of the, the booklets that are in the, in the church office. And I read a statement in that book, and though it was written about this church in 1995, 28 years ago, it still holds true today. Here's what it said. It said, it should be noted that God has been very good to the people of this church and the local community. It was noted that. And the title of that booklet, as some of you may remember, is We Dedicate This Sanctuary, This One, to the Lord. But there's more to that statement than just words. Because there has been action since 1995, even before, there has been action behind those words. And some of the action was good, maybe some was bad. Some worked, some didn't. Some worked then and times changed, and so it didn't work then again. New things are working. But no matter the outcome, there has been dedication from this body of Christ. And that dedication continues today. Some things are different, some are the same, but the dedication to the Lord has remained the same. And that's what being a disciple is all about. And being a disciple, it means that we dedicate our lives to the Lord, individually and together as one. Each and every day, each and every hour, each and every second. So I say thank you, God, for calling us all to be your disciples. And all of God's disciples say, Amen. Amen. Let us go into a time of prayer. We're going to begin our prayer this morning with a prayer from theologian William Barclay. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks for all that you have done for us, that you have created us and have given us the gift of life and set us to live in this fair earth, that you have given us work to do and the strength to do it. We give you thanks for all that others have done for us, for those who taught us when we were children, for those who in the days of youth gave us guidance that kept us from going astray, from those who to this day love us and surround us with their care. We give you thanks for all that your church has done for us, for strength and guidance each week for life's way, for the friendship and the fellowship which we here enjoy, for the sacraments of your grace and the prayers of your people. We give you thanks for all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ, that in Christ you have shown us the length and depth and height of your great love for us. And in Christ, you have opened to us a new and living way into your presence. We give you thanks for everything that has given us strength for earth and hope for heaven. And accept this our sacrifice of praise for your love's sake. Lord, we lift up to you those who are on our hearts and our minds today. We lift up to you those who care for others and feel their pain as their own. We lift up to you all of those in need and those whose struggles and worries are great. Lord, hear our prayers in this time of silence. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 